how are you guys today? Well, we got a big one ahead of us. I'm probably going to do this in two parts because it's just massive. It usually stretches out over a couple class sessions. But it's kind of the meat of the course. And I mean, if there's a lecture that people would expect to see in psych and law, this is probably it. So it's lecture 10. We're finally there. Forensic assessment in criminal cases. We're going to explore competence and, and insanity. So uh, Penelope seems interested, or maybe not. Now that she heard what it's about, she's leaving. So. I hope that doesn't happen with you guys. Forensic assessment, what is it? It's when psychologists or psychiatrists evaluate the mental status of defendants. Right? There's two basic questions that are answered as a result of this process. Is the defendant competent to stand trial? And if so, is the defendant in some way not responsible for their acts? Right? So uh, that's where we're going with this. This leads to an important distinction then. And this is going to be demonstrated throughout this lecture. Competency and insanity. Now, competency then, the basic question is the defendant fit to stand trial? And what this requires then is what is the defendant's mental state now at the time of the trial or in the time leading up to the trial, right? Now, insanity, interesting, refers to their mental state at the time of the crime. So this is always a retrospective judgment. And it's, are they to be held responsible for their actions? So uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get going with this. Now, a uh, couple things. Forensic psychology. If you're expecting, uh, you know, a psych and law to be a class in forensic psychology, it's not. I've had a course in forensic psychology. Uh, I was so fortunate to get a, a class in forensic psychology when I was an under, undergraduate at Irvine, taught by Dr. Raymond Navaco, who is a forensic psychology. He assesses offenders. I mean, that's part of what he does. Now, Navaco is a lot more than that because he was an excellent teacher, and he was also as much a social psychologist and designed research in within the domain of social psychology. So he represents this huge, this, this wonderful intersection of talents and capabilities. And, and I love Dr. Novako dearly. Dr. Novako would have office hours after class. And because he's such a, a high flute and professor, uh, he got to choose his class time, which was always late morning to lunchtime. And then after class was his office hours. And there was a cafe at UCI uh, inside the ring, right? Because it's built on a hill that's this ring. Right, and this one cafe you would always go to, and he says, "Office hours at the cafe," and I would go. And the funny thing is, no one else went to office hours, so I got to sit with Navaco, just me and Navaco, right, uh, quarter after quarter after quarter. And I took three classes with him, and uh, the exception was there was one quarter where we were quite frequently joined with a woman, a young woman named Edja. She was Croatian, and this is. 1998, so there's some issues in the Balkans during that time, right? The Balkans War. And Edja had a lot of stories to tell us about Croatia and uh, the, the troubles that they were facing. So I considered it a, a tremendous use of my time. Now, Novako taught a course in forensic psychology. I took that class. One of the last classes I took at UCI, it was a seminar. There was only 15 of us because he had the oomph to teach a 15-person class, and it was fascinating. It was a great class. But forensic psychology might be boring for an awful lot of students because it really is about instruments used to assess competence as much as anything, right, and interviewing offenders. So it's can be kind of dry when you get right down to it. I'm hoping to keep this a little fun, uh, kind of, you know, a, as fun as it can be, because we're going to talk about some nasty shit. So uh, be, be prepared in that regard. Right. Quincy, are you sitting in for this one, buddy? All right. So let's take our little quiz here. And uh, this is actually part of the homework assignment. You'll see there's a place to fill in the quiz as well. So I'm going to show you a picture. And uh, can you name who it is? And then what this lecture is about, right, is decide whether they were insane at the time of the crime, right, and if they were competent to stand trial. So you might want to grab your pencil and paper, whatever, 
set up something on your PC or your tablet or whatever that you can record this information. Are you going to knock all this shit down, Quincy? You have the power to do it, buddy. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm fearing for the monitor. Yeah, it's bungee corded in here, but uh, as big as this guy is, I think it's possible he could just destroy everything very quickly here. So, that'll be entertaining for you guys, if nothing else. Are you ready for the quiz? I gave you time. I was, I was killing time there. I gave you time to get your pencil and paper. So, here you go. Who am I? Number one. So again, do you know who this person is? If so, write down their name. And were they found insane? Were they competent to stand trial? And you might not know those, right? Uh, that's getting to be pretty detailed. But at least, can you name who it is, right? Let's go to number two. We got 13 in all. Number two. There you go. Number two, not the best representative of the Buckeyes. That'll be a hint there, okay? Who am I? Number three. <laughs> That's some creepy shit, huh? This might be one of the easier ones. There's some that are, are a couple easy, uh, a little more easy than, than, than others in this regard, right? So uh, number three might be one of the easier ones. And what always blows my mind, when we do this in class, right, uh, which, hey, maybe we'll get back to one of these days, right, when we do this in class, we, we can usually identify one or two students in the class who knows all of them, and it's like, all right, so what is your story if you know all these killers? So, just kidding. All right, number four, here you go. This one scared the shit out of me when I was a kid, because this was a Southern California phenomenon, right? Who am I? Quincy, who is that? Yeah. Bad actor. No two ways about it. Let's go on to number five. Who am I? Arguably the smartest of all the people I'm going to show you. Okay. Number six. Who am I? Number seven, one of the tougher ones, especially for you guys. This was very, very pertinent in the news, uh, but over a short period of time. But certainly a good example uh, for this. Local boy gone bad. All right. Another hint. Who am I? Number eight. And if you're not absolutely sure, can you m perhaps imagine? Yeah, another hint. There you go. Holy shit, Penelope. She's running around here. All right. <laughs> Who am I? Number nine. No, just kidding. Not one of the list, right? This is just my feeble attempt at humor. That, of course, is Saddam Hussein, so he's not on our list. Although he's responsible for the death of a huge number of people. Uh, there <laughs> <laughs> right, and and there was a trial, but I don't think the insanity defense was ever on the table. This might be the most famous of the whole bunch. I don't know. All uh, right, depending on your exposure. Who am I? Number ten. Handsome devil, if nothing else. Right, Quincy. Would you get into a Volkswagen Beetle with this guy? Uh, I hope the answer is no. All right. Who am I? Number 11. And interestingly, uh, when we look at, if we're looking for diversity, this is one of our first offers of diversity here. Not a lot of African American, uh, African Americans on this list, right? So, but who am I? Number 11. And now, if we join Peabody and Sherman, let's get into the Wayback Machine. Yes, and we're going to go way back. But a super important case, as an example, who am I, number 12? And then finally, number 13, who am I? 
So I'm asking you to stay tuned for the answers. Homework part one, right? There you go. Okay, so you see uh, homework number seven, part one. What do we got? We got the name. You can write down the name. Uh, were they competent to stand trial? Yes or no. And found insane? Yes or no. And that's kind of your summary table there. Uh, now, caveat on this lecture. I have chosen some of the most extreme examples that really test the system of determining competency and determining sanity that, that pushes the system to its limits, right? So this is not going to be an average representation of what goes on. This is an exercise in extremes, but it's at the extremes that test how well our legal system operates. So I'm going to be mean to the legal system, let me warn you. And I've chosen extreme cases to show kind of the boundary conditions and the effectiveness of how the system operates. So let's begin. And now we're just going to go through, we're going to tell a little story, we're going to talk about competence and sanity in reference to each of these cases. So who, who am I number four? Who got this one? Who knows who this is? Well, if you're thinking that's Charles Manson, you would be absolutely correct. So this is Charles Manson, and uh, that's a rather intense gaze, and certainly a wonderful hairstyle, if you will. Right? And here's some of Charles Manson's family members uh, being brought in by the police. And, and, and what's the deal with Manson and his family? Again, another picture of his family, these peaceniks, right? Manson looking over them. Was Manson a cult leader? Well, yeah. Uh, he, he fits the definition well enough. Manson had a horrible life. As a child, I mean, he was abused, he was abandoned, he was not well cared for. That Manson developed into criminal behavior is a classic story of poor parenting, poor circumstances. He was in and out of prison half of his life, right? It was so bad that at one point his uncle, his mother's brother, came to the house his mother had an alcohol problem, among other things. Came to the house to see Charlie, little Charlie, and he says, Hey, where's Charlie? And mom didn't answer, didn't answer, and then finally said, Where's Charlie? And finally she fessed up. He had been traded to the bartender for her bar tab. I mean, so the uncle went and retrieved him. This is kind of Charles Manson's background. He thought that he could become, in fact, a musical performer. He liked to write and perform music. And he was rejected by the studios. So uh, no one had any interest in his ability uh, or lack thereof to do music. We see that he had a very horrible beginning. And, and Manson's idea was, you know, as his relationship to the world became increasingly distorted, was he had determined that, in fact... things were going to fall apart. That the world was essentially going to fall apart. And what was going to happen, what he predicted, was there was going to be a race war. And because of their superior abilities, African Americans would win this race war. That is, because of their physical abilities, their prowess, uh, their strength, their intensity, they would win the race war. But then, he also held this prejudice that they were intellectually inferior. So once they won, they wouldn't know what the hell to do now that they'd won. So he would rise as a messiah and he would lead these people uh, in a new world. So Manson got tired of waiting. So he decided that he would, in fact, attempt to accelerate the race war. That is, get it started. Uh, you know, throw some gasoline out there and, and then light the match to create the race war conflagration. One way he decided to do this was he would take his family members, whom he plied with drugs, sex, etc., all these cult-like behaviors, and convince them to go out and commit murders that would appear to be racially motivated, and then in fact that would then kick the race war into high gear. Uh, the first murder was Sharon Tate. So Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski's wife at the time, was pregnant. She had several people over at her house up in the Hollywood Hills, right? And uh, creepy, when I was a private patrol officer, these are the areas I patrolled. So I, I 
patrolled around Sharon Tate's house and many others. This is after Manson, though, after the fact. Uh, and what he did is he convinced five of his followers to go to Sharon Tate's home and to kill everybody there. Now, notice Manson didn't go. He stayed at home. This is the kind of power that Manson had over people, was he convinced other people to go commit the most heinous of crimes. And, and everyone in the house was stabbed. Uh, Sharon Tate was uh, pregnant, tremendously pregnant, and, and the fetus was killed. Uh, it was a horrible crime, and then they write uh, on the walls, in the victim's blood, pigs, etc., ideas that would communicate that this was a racially motivated killing. Okay? And then not too long after that, Rosemary and Leo LaBianco, famous grocery store chain owners in Southern California, were killed in their home. And, and I found this one especially creepy. Uh, one of the places that I had to patrol when I was a private patrolman, I worked nights. I preferred to work nights because there was no traffic, so it was easier to drive around. And nights are just kind of chill out driving around in the Hollywood Hills, Glendale, all these great areas. Uh, Mulholland Drive, you can look at the lights. I mean, uh, but... I had to walk this one uh, monastery, and it was a big monastery up on top of a hill in Glendale. And, and every night, the, the specification from our customer, the monastery, was you have to walk the perimeter from any time from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., right? And it was uh, always creepy because it's dark and it's wooded, you know, and, and that kind of stuff is just a little creepy in itself. But it was right next door to the La Bianca's home. So I'm like, oh, my God, are the ghosts of the La Bianca's here? So, uh, and, and this is Manson's followers. Now, we're fast-forwarding. Now, Manson has been arrested, and a bunch of his uh, followers who committed the murders have been arrested. And these are other followers, not arrested, not implicated in the crimes, who would camp out near the courthouse in Los Angeles and do all these wacky antics. Like they would crawl on their hands and knees for blocks to get to the court to view the trial. Right? Now in this case, you probably can't see it, but they have X's carved in their forehead. What happened is one day Manson somehow in his cell during the trial, carved a swastika in his forehead with like a broken piece of glass, what have you. Well, they attended the trial that day. They see Manson with this X carved in his forehead. So they go home and they do the same thing and they show up the next day with that. Notice, Manson didn't even, wasn't even able to direct them to do this. This is something they did because he did. This is the kind of power and influence that Manson had over people. Now, Bugliosi, Vincent Bugliosi, was the district attorney who prosecuted Manson, and he's a hardcore prosecutor. This is a nasty guy, and he wrote the book about his experience, Helter Skelter, right? Uh, and that is the Manson murders and the trial for the murders. It's a good book, uh, interesting book. It can be a scary book at times, and... and at one point, Bogliosi, who is not given to mysticism, metaphysics, or anything else, this is a hard-nosed prosecutor, right? He said that Manson had this way of staring at you that would unnerve you. But he said it went beyond that, because at one point in time, he felt Manson staring at him. He looked at Manson, and Manson kind of gave him a look as he's staring at him. And then Bogliosi looked at his watch, which is a really nice Rolex, all right? And it has stopped. And Manson just kind of went like, that is the, the and, and Bugliosi is, is half convinced that Manson actually somehow mentally stopped his watch. Manson is a creepy guy. He's a scary character, right? So, the Manson murders, Helter Skelter, where does the term Helter Skelter come from? Well, Manson believed that the Beatles were communicating directly to him and that Helter Skelter was the song prescribing the race war. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if... Obviously, if you want to listen to the whole thing, I'm, I'm sure you can find it well enough. That's off the Beatles' White Album, the final album that the Beatles released. A largely disjointed album where the Beatles had all but broken up and were all kind of doing their own thing. Anyway, Manson believed that, in fact, the Beatles were communicating with him. Manson had the power to affect people in this most powerful way. So what happened with Manson? Well, Manson was being tried for murder. Sharon Tate, all her guests, the LaBiancas, 
even though he wasn't present, he was, and Bugliosi was trying him because he caused the murders to happen. And that was the nature of Bugliosi's case. Well, Manson became irritated with his attorneys and at one point fired his attorneys with the decision to represent himself. And we're going to talk more about this self-representation as we move through. Ultimately, though, uh, the question then becomes, is Manson capable of functioning meaningfully and knowingly in the legal system? That is, especially as his own counsel. Now, they allowed this uh, charade to go on for, for a while. He still had attorneys advising him to a certain extent, but his representation was basically being taken care of himself. Right, Annika? And, of course, Manson was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to death. The death penalty was overturned, and at that point, then Manson was remanded to uh, state prison in California for life. Right? And he still remains in prison for life. Uh, which is probably a really good place for Manson. And it's always scary to think in terms of who else is he able to manipulate. Uh, so, question is, and at this point, do we believe that Manson should be allowed to represent himself? Is he competent to do this? And if he's not competent, then is it fair that he be allowed to do so. So when we talk about competency, it's not just about self-representation, it's about many facets of the legal system. Uh, first and foremost, understanding what's going on. Uh, so do we understand the legal system? Can we assist in our own defense? And notice, this is falling short of can I manage my own defense, but can I assist in my defense, right? Can I make legally relevant decisions? can be raised at any time, but usually this is raised as a pre-trial question to plead guilty or to stand trial. There might be the question of competency, like the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooter Holmes, right? The question is, is this guy competent to stand trial? Uh, Jared Loeffner, right, who, who uh, was, was determined as a schizophrenic as well, involved in, in the shooting, the parking lot shooting of the congressman, Congresswoman Gabby Gifford. The question is, okay, so we've diagnosed schizophrenia. Is the disorder so extreme that the person is then unable to understand what it is that's happening to them? Are they unable then to assist their defense team? And are they able to, to weigh the pros and cons of different legal strategies in which they should probably be participating? And note, in, in some cases, that is, uh, with law firms especially, it's like, dude, you know, you're not, you've been found not competent to stand trial. So what they did is eventually forced him to take his medication to put his schizophrenia in remission so that he would become competent to stand trial, which is, is one option. We'll explore that a little later. So the law requires the defendant to be competent because why might that be? Well, let's think about it. The trial is only fair if the defendant can participate in the defense. You know, if the, if the defendant doesn't understand that they're on trial, or they don't understand what the purpose of the trial is, if they don't understand what's at stake, is it legit, is it fair then to subject them to the trial? And, you know, quite often then the question comes back, no, uh, they're not. So punishment is only morally defensible if the target understands why it's happening. To punish someone and have them have no clue as to why they're being punished seems quite unfair when you get right down to it. Now, the perceived fairness of the adversarial system, and think about it, we are the adversarial system, right? We're not an inquisitorial system, and we discussed this very early in the course. We are an adversarial system, and the idea is that we fight, and we fight hard, and, and whoever fights the hardest wins, right? And if someone can't fight, does it make sense? How many of us want to just watch some defenseless person get beaten and get beaten and get beaten? At some point, we say, stop beating them because they can't fight back. And this is kind of the essence of competency. They can't fight. So, homework seven, part two. It's all about perceptions, baby, right? Remember lecture 8.1? Please give an explanation to further support each of the three points below. And if you can do this inspired by lecture 8.1, that would be awesome, right? A, so expand on this idea. 
trial is only fair if defendant can participate in defense. How does that dovetail with Lecture 8.1? B. Punishment is only morally defensible if the target understands what's happening. And again, 8.1 might help to inform, but craft a statement to support this, right? Expand on this idea. I've given you a bullet point. Let's do a short paragraph expanding on it. And then C, perceived fairness of the adversarial system relies on the defendant fighting back, and certainly that is supported by 8.1, okay? Questions about that? So look, we already got two points of the homework under our belt. Let us move forward, Annika. Where shall we go next? Competency to stand trial. Well, believe it or not, there's a standard. The Dusky standard was applied to this, right? And this comes from previous court cases. And they say the Dusky standard is a rational and factual understanding of the proceedings. So when we assess someone's competency according to the Dusky standard, we ask questions like, are they aware of the nature of the proceedings? Do they understand it's a trial? Do they understand what the trial is for? Can they cooperate with the counsel in preparing the defense? Right? Now the Edwards standard that came to us in 2008 in Indiana versus Edwards says if you want to serve as your own counsel a la Charles Manson right? then competence is assessed at a higher level than the Dusky standard. Dusky standard gets us to the trial. That is, okay, we can have a trial because you pass the criteria in the Dusky standard, but you said you want to represent yourself. Ah, eh, well, we're going to apply the Edwards standard to that point. Do you have the level of competence to, in fact, lead your own defense, to act as your own attorney? Right? And that's a much higher standard. So, and we'll, we'll talk more about this as, as these unfold. Note, I'm giving you extreme examples once again. So that is kind of, I, I think it makes the election more interesting. So, competency to plead guilty? Well, think about this. Competency to stand trial is one thing. But what if I decide I don't want to stand trial? I just want to plead guilty. I want to, let's say, engage in a plea bargain. Well, then... The competency to plead guilty is assessed along certain criteria, like must understand alternatives and have the ability to make a reasoned choice. That is, if I plead guilty, this is likely to happen. If I go to trial, this is likely to happen. Or these are the realm of possibilities and what could happen. Am I capable of figuring that out, right? So do I understand the possible consequences of pleading guilty? And remember, one of the big consequences to engaging in a plea bargain is we give up our constitutional rights. Once I plead guilty in a plea bargain, there's no more appeals. We're done at that point, right? So being able to make a rational choice by weighing the consequences, the possible choices. Okay, so here we go. Let us talk another case then. Who am I, number seven? Anyone? Remember the hint, local boy makes it big time? Well then, this is Charles McCoy Jr. And let's let the story unfold on this one. Well, what do we know about Charles McCoy Jr.? Well, we're going to jump in mid-story here. Charles McCoy Jr., 29, appears in court in May after jurors could not agree whether he was mentally ill. And this comes to us from the Columbus Dispatch. What do we know? Well, McCoy entered an insanity plea for his crimes and the jury could not come to a unanimous decision. So it resulted in a hung jury, which is a mistrial. So where do we go from there? Well, Charles McCoy Jr. had admitted firing the shots over five months in 2003 and 2004, but pleaded innocent by reason of insanity to murder and 23 other counts. His death penalty trial ended in the mistrial. So... Where, what, what comes next? Well, Ohio Highway Sniper, and I, I have issues with the term sniper. He was a shooter, not a sniper. Uh, snipers hit their targets. McCoy invariably missed except for one shot, or he actually killed somebody. Right. Columbus, a mentally ill man, pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and 10 other charges Tuesday in a series of Ohio Highway shootings and was sentenced to 27 years in prison. So, unfold the sequence. He's captured. He's tried. He's not guilty by reason of insanity defense. The jury can't make a decision. It ends in a mistrial. So, 
Now, hmm, pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. So he cops a plea the second time around. Well, McCoy of Columbus told psychiatrists he threw wood and bags of concrete mix off the highway overpasses, and he shot at cars to quiet voices in his head that called him a wimp. Okay. Well, those of us with minimal knowledge of schizophrenia probably remember that the most common hallucination in schizophrenia is auditory hallucinations. So he's got voices telling him he's a wimp, right? Uh, but psychiatrists both sides agree that McCoy had severe delusions, that television programs and commercials were speaking directly to him and mocking him. And this is consistent with, you know, the auditory hallucinations for a schizophrenic. Toward the end of the shootings, he believed that firing from overpasses would make news coverage of Michael Jackson stop. And of course, this is the Michael Jackson at Neverland being uh, getting in trouble for potential child abuse. Uh, so, and, and this was on the news all the time, and I'm sure most people were sick of hearing about Michael Jackson. So you can see that, that the voices, according to McCoy, were directing him to do these things on Interstate 270 because it will have the effect of quieting the news. So the first trial, in w uh, which ended in May with the jury unable to decide whether he was insane or not, centered on McCoy's delusions, kept him from understanding that the shootings were wrong. And we're going to find in the definition of insanity that knowing not knowing it's wrong right is a, is a key component of that defense right the prosecution psychiatrist said McCoy still showed he knew his actions were wrong by the steps he took to avoid capture such as moving the shootings to other counties when it public publicity focused on I270 so now we're going to go down I70 and, and to pick a way to do the shootings some people would say well he must have known what he was doing was wrong because he tried to conceal what he was doing or try to evade capture maybe Maybe, maybe not, right? Now, McCoy cried as he began to read a statement apologizing to his victims, and his attorney took over. He also cried as the victims told the judge how they'd been affected by the shootings, and this would be in the victim impact statements uh, as, as part of the trial process. I want to thank my family for their love and support, especially my mom, his attorney, Haney, read. I I'm sorry for not taking my medication and putting everyone through this. So, Let's look at where we're at. The first trial, where he offers an insanity defense, says, no, uh, sorry, we can't get there. And now the second trial reduces the charges. They want to go to trial again, but avoiding that second trial, McCoy then cops a guilty plea. My question is, and of course I'm poking at the legal system pretty severely throughout this lecture, how do we believe that, let's say, McCoy was in fact competent to plead guilty. And notice, competency and insanity are two different things, so that we'll, we'll return to the, the difference between these throughout this lecture. Okay. So other competencies, competency to confess. Remember the reed in technique of interrogation we talked about? And remember, Reed said that it's critical to understand the mental state of the defendant when they're being questioned. Or the suspect, I guess, would be the more appropriate term at that point. So are they competent to confess? Is this a competency? Should it be a measured competency? Are they competent to waive their right to an attorney? Now note, this isn't the question of the Edwards standard, are they competent to represent themselves? This is a kind of a step ahead of that or before that. Are they competent to say, no, I don't want an attorney? How about the competency to refuse the insanity defense? What if cl someone's clearly insane, but they say, no, I'm not insane. Uh, should we assess the competence of a defendant to make that judgment about themselves? Yeah, this gets pretty tricky, huh? Competence to be sentenced. And remember, we've already said that punishment is not morally supportable if someone doesn't understand why they're being punished. So, the competency of juveniles is a whole other issue because we can talk in terms of mental illness delusional thinking in juveniles, but beyond that, then we also get to entertain the idea of developmental delays or just simply being so young that a certain level of development hasn't been achieved. Remember what Piaget told us, 
and I know Piaget falls in and out of favor, but formal operations begin when? That is, conceptual thinking begins when, according to Piaget? Kind of 11 or 12, right? So competency of juveniles might be in question. Now, here we go. Here's another one. Who am I? Number 11. It's the only African-American in our group. Anyone, who is this? Colin Ferguson. Okay. Now, Colin Ferguson, right? Well, suddenly Ferguson stood. This is a witness account. Uh, suddenly Ferguson stood and fired his gun at a woman. He continued to shoot, hitting several more passengers. This is on a commuting train. He's also known as the commuter train shooter. Right? Some tried to escape into the next car or hide behind seats. Those who saw the shooter reported later he had a blank look on his face. He fired 15 rounds in approximately 10 seconds. That's out of his semi-automatic pistol, right? And then he reloaded, walking up the island, shooting. Then he stopped. Someone shouted others to grab him. People did so, and he pleaded for those people not to hurt him at that point in time. Holy shit, right? So what do we know? Colin Ferguson st stood up on a commuter train, and he decided to start shooting people. This is kind of a slam dunk of a case. How many witnesses do we have? I mean, we got a commuter train full of people. We got all the witnesses we could ever want, right? So, Colin Ferguson then is brought up onto the, you know, he's brought into court. It's time for his trial, and the judge reads the charges. And of course, there were 93 charges against him. A lot of crime committed in this instance. 93 charges he's being tried for. The judge has the charges read. Then the judge looks at Colin Ferguson and says, Colin Ferguson, do you understand the charges against you? Ferguson's reply. Of course there are 93 counts against me. It was 1993. <laughs> let's consider this, right? Let's consider what has just occurred here. Colin Ferguson has been asked if he understands the 93 charges, and he says, of course there's 93 charges, because it happened in 1993. As a judge, what might you think at this point in time? Well, what the judge thought at this point in time is the trial should go on. Go on. Some of us might not agree with that. So, we see the description of what happened, and then he stopped. Someone shouted, others to grab him. They did so. The next stop, he was removed. In less than two minutes, 19 people had been wounded and six were dead. This is a heinous shooting. That is how many victims? 25 victims in a matter of minutes. Right? So what do we know? Colin Ferguson, the Long Island commuter train shooter, he fired the attorneys in order to represent himself. Question is, is he competent to represent himself? And according to what standard? Dusky, Edwards, what standards are we assessing competence of Colin Ferguson? Competent under Dusky, yes. Unlikely under Edwards. Attorneys wanted him to mount a black rage defense. And the idea was, this insanity defense is based on the fact that as a black man, you've been put down so much in your life, constantly put down, put down, put down, that finally you freaking snapped. You just snapped, and you were out of control, and you shot up all these people on the train. Right? Well, insane, no, but his former attorney uh, assistant offers that, that Kuby later said the proof of Ferguson's insanity was that he wouldn't plead insane. And he said, no, there was no black rage defense because I didn't commit the crime. And he maintained to the very last minute that he never committed the crime. Can you imagine the spectacle, right, that, that Ferguson maintains is innocent and thus would not allow the black rage defense or any type of not guilty by reason of insanity. So this whole trial unfolds and this whole macabre event takes place where you have the shooter of these people representing himself in court and, and cross-examining witnesses. So, you know, a, a def a, the district attorney says, hey, can you identify the man who shot you? And, and the witness is on the stand, and they say, yeah, it's that guy. With Ferguson standing right there. And then Ferguson's turn to cross-examine those witnesses. Uh, it, it's even hard to imagine the spectacle that unfolded at this point in time. Are we surprised that Ferguson, right, was found guilty? I mean, the, the, this just a slam dunk on this one. Uh, and he was sentenced to life without parole.
Yeah. Now, should that trial have been allowed to go on? That, that's my big question here. Uh, under what possible uh, idea do we believe that, com that Ferguson was competent to represent himself when he says, yeah, of course there's 93 counts. It was 93. So it's a tough one, right? All right. All right, we all know this guy, huh? How many people know this guy? Anyone? This looks like Ted Bundy, if you ask me. All right. And now, here is the sad, very sad truth here. We have to think in terms of, it's maybe interesting to be fascinated by killers. But often our, our attention shifts away from the victims. And so, uh, a, a small tribute to some of Bundy's victims. And note, this is just eight of maybe the 30-some victims that, that Ted had at his hands, on his bloody hands. And do you notice anything? They all look surprisingly familiar, don't they? Surprisingly similar to each other. And I mean, these are very look an awful lot like Ted Bundy's girlfriend who rejected him. So let's talk a little bit about Ted's story. Michaud, uh, who was a man who interviewed Ted repeatedly, uh, writes that Ted won a summer scholarship to prestig uh, prestigious Stanford University in California just to impress her. That is his girlfriend, right? But at Stanford, his immaturity was exposed. Uh, he writes, Ted did not understand why the mask he'd been using had failed him. His first tentative foray into the sophisticated world had ended in disaster. Right? So it wasn't quite up to snuff at that point in time and, and never got there. In, in 1968, after his girlfriend graduated from the University of Washington, she broke off relations with Ted. She was a practical young woman and seemed to realize that Ted had some serious character flaws that took him out of the running as husband material. And good on her, huh? The, the, she picked up on that. Uh, I, I think it's kind of the understatement of the world, but uh, interesting. Ted never recovered from the breakup. Nothing, including school, seemed to hold any interest for him, and he eventually dropped out, dumbfounded and depressed over the breakup. And we see that Ted Bundy, among many qualities that he had, narcissistic personality disorder is probably at the top of the list. Right? In April of 1977, Ted was transferred to Garfield County Jail. Now he's been arrested. He was transferred to the county jail in Colorado to await trial for the murder of Karen Campbell. During the preparation of his case, Bundy became increasingly unhappy with his representation. He believed his lawyer to be inept, and eventually he fired him. So here we go. Bundy's going to represent himself. Now, Bundy, experienced in law, and let's put the air quotes around that, because he was pre-law for a little while, believed he could do the job better and began to take his own up, up, up his own defense in the case. He felt confident he could succeed in the trial scheduled for November 14, 1977. He had a lot of work ahead of him. He was granted permission to leave the confines of the jail on occasion and utilize the courthouse library in Aspen to conduct his research. What the police didn't understand was that he was planning an escape and he got himself through uh, uh, this impossibly small air duct, right, and, and was able to escape. And he was caught and he freaking escaped again. So Bundy is intelligent, he's manipulative. He's charming. Uh, many people argue that Bundy is a psychopath, and he probably meets most of the criteria for that. Uh, some people obviously think he is. So then Ted starts looking at his own, uh, uh, start acting as his own attorney, and check him out. Man, this guy is styling. Right? He's glib, he's charming, he's handsome, he's intelligent, he's got all his documents there, he's ready to go. This is Ted Bundy in court, but the trial, of course, does not go well. Uh, the forensic evidence is interesting against him. One of the key pieces of the forensic evidence uh, against Ted Bundy was bite marks. And that is, he would often have sex with his victims after he killed them. And on this one victim, he allegedly bit the victim's breast and left bite marks. And they used dental records to then demonstrate that those bite marks were 
uh, TEDs. Now, these, this bite mark evidence is some of the worst evidence on the planet, I mean, as far as being reliable evidence. And this is going back to one of the assignments we talked about uh, earlier in the course, right? The quality of evidence. So, but Ted was convicted. He was found guilty. And uh, th now, now we see the true Bundy reaction at this point in time. So, uh, the mask, right, has failed Ted once again at this point. And, and for someone with nar narcissistic personality disorder, they will, you know, be the best defense they have for themselves. They will perform a rep uh, they will represent themselves successfully and they will win the case. And uh, narcissists often react violently and excessively emotionally upon finding out that maybe they weren't effective. So, Ted Bundy. Let's talk about the Sixth Amendment then, uh, and, and the right to self-representation. So from Feretta versus California, circa 75, reaffirm, reaffirm the right to self-representation. Yes, people should be able to represent themselves. And from Feretta versus California, the judge and the defendant have a conversation, and the judge makes a determination at that point, uh, which seems, you know, kind of loose in terms of guidelines. Now, the state versus Christoffi in 92 spells out the criteria. So it's not we're just going to have this conversation. Now we're going to assess the contents of that conversation according to a predefined criteria. Does the defendant then, can they demonstrate that they understand the disadvantages of self-representation? Right? Do they understand the knowledge about the charges and, and the punishment for them? Do they understand the potential risks of an unsuccessful defense? Okay. And do they have knowledge of the rules of evidence procedure? And you can see that we're, for a fair trial, this would be really critical. And this might be one of the toughest things is what are rules regarding evidence? Remember we talked about the discovery process? We had that CLE, that continuing legal education presentation that I showed you. And we talked about the discovery process. That's a relatively complex process. Would you in an effort to represent yourself, understand the ins and outs of what's Brady material and what isn't. And this is a difficult thing to represent oneself, and we know the cliché, right? I've heard the cliché said two ways, but they're both equally appropriate. One who represents himself has a fool for an attorney, right, is one way to look at it. The difficulty of acting as one's own counsel, so all these now kind of flesh out Freda versus California, in the state versus Christoffi. Are you ready for another one? Let's try another one here. Who am I? Number five. Styling looking kind of guy, huh? Probably needs to brush his hair. Probably could use a shave. But this is how he liked to kind of hang out in his cabin in Wyoming. Anyone? Yep, this is Theodore Kaczynski. And Theodore Kaczynski is the Unabomber. Right. So what did Theodore Kaczynski do? He resented technology. He thought technology would be the destruction of the world. So he mounted a one-man mission against technology, and he would manufacture bombs and send them to people in academia and in technical fields. So these are mail bombs. So you go and you open up this package, and boom, it explodes. Uh, the bombs got more and more effective as time went on. Ted was an efficient learner, so he learned to design more and more effective bombs. Well, what do we know? Ted Kaczynski, as a Unabomber, wrote a manifesto decrying technology. He sent this manifesto. Uh, it was available to the police. And, you know, the police were stymied. Ted was really, really intelligent. He was a Berkeley math professor. Yep. Got his PhD in mathematics, taught at Berkeley, but became dissatisfied with that, chucked it all, and bought this tiny little 12 by 12 foot cabin in, in Montana or Wyoming, wherever the hell it was, and he lived out there by himself. And he was writing his manifesto. And, and here's the deal. Anyone you know who's writing a manifesto, you might want to hand their name over to law, enfe law enforcement because there's few good things historically that have come from people who've written manifestos. I mean, it's just, ah. So, interestingly, the police are getting, because Kaczynski had an IQ of 180. This dude is like super genius, right? And, and, and what he does is he's writing this manifesto, and then he makes a bomb, 
And once he makes the bomb, he determines the target, he gets himself all cleaned up, puts on clothes, rides his bicycle to a bus station, takes a bus here, to a bus there, to a bus there, anywhere in the country, right? Got his suit, got himself all cleaned up, goes to a certain mail facility, etc. I mean, the, he's untraceable. And it's like, law enforcement is never going to find this guy. So ultimately what they do is they publish the manifesto. They ask the press to publish the manifesto, something they wanted to keep under wraps. As a last resort, they publish the manifesto. And I kid you not, no shit, this is the most amazing thing in the world. One morning, Ted's brother, over coffee and breakfast, opens up the newspaper, and here is the printed manifesto. And Ted's brother starts reading this and says, holy shit, I can't believe this. Ted has gone off the rails. He recognized it as his brother's writing and calls the FBI. And then the rest was history. The FBI went and arrested him at his shack with his dog in, in, out in, in the wilderness. Right? So what do we know about Kaczynski then? Well, the attorneys are saying, dude, You've been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. We're going to mount an insanity defense. And Ted Kaczynski says, no, you're not going to mount an insanity defense. I'm going to plead guilty to the crimes. And they said, no, dude, you got a solid insanity defense. We're going to plead insanity. And he says, nope. And he walks right past him. He goes to the judge, and he pleads guilty to all the charges against him. He cops a plea. Why? Because he didn't want people to think he was crazy. Let us reflect on that strangeness for a moment. Okay, so the competency evaluation process. Then, how, how do we do this? Well, someone raises the question of competence. They say, I, "I'm not sure that this guy's competent." Someone, right? And then the judge orders an evaluation. Says, "We need to have you evaluated for your uh, competence to stand trial or make these other decisions, if you will." Okay. It may be done by a psychiatrist, it may be done by a psychologist, a physician, but most competency evaluations are done by social workers. Because most competency evaluations are concerning extremely minor cases. Right? To be exciting, to be interesting, I'm, I'm taking the most high-profile, crazy-ass cases. But most of the time, there's nothing like this. Right? It's very simple. It's like... Uh, our, our former neighbor who was standing on the balcony of her house, naked, right, shouting at all of us that she was the queen of the hilltop. That's more in line with the normal average type of case when people uh, intersect with the trial process and insanity and competence are the issues, right? Not, not these high-profile cases, right? So social workers do the bulk of the work here. Evaluations have become more specific to assess abilities pertinent to the legal system. Once the competence evaluation is done, the report on competence is given to the judge, and about 95% of the time the judges go with the contents of the report. They, they don't refute them. They just go along with it because they ordered the report in the first place. Now, you're not responsible for these, and I'm not going to belabor these. Uh, I do put these here because there are different instruments that are used to assess competency, and these instruments are being refined and new ones are being introduced all the time. This would be par a significant part of what you would study in a class in forensic psychology, okay, is these different competency instruments. And this is something we did in Novako's class. And, uh, and to tell you the truth, I didn't find this part of the class all that interesting. You compare all these different competency tests, and, and you look at the pros and cons of them, right, and, and you learn the inside and out in preparation of perhaps becoming a forensic psychologist, right? So you can take a look at these at your leisure. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time with them. There's not mu mu much mileage to be gained, but I do want to give you a smattering of, of what's available here. Okay? So, uh, and, and just some, some are more legally toned, some are more psychiatrically toned. Some actually attempt to bridge the gap between legal point of view and psychological point of view. Okay? Now, results of the competency evaluations, about 70% of people are found competent, at least 30% not competent. Those found IST incompetent to stand trial, what do we know? Well, they have a history of treatment for mental illness and symptoms of serious mental illness. Are you surprised? <laughs> Duh, right? They tend to be single, unemployed, and poorly educated, correlational. It's not causational by any means. They score poorly on competence assessment tests. No shit, 
right? All right. So, what can be done with those found not competent? Well, charges might be dropped. Maybe it's an exchange for a promise to undergo treatment, often outpatient treatment, that it's just not that severe a crime. They may be returned to the institution to be treated like Loeffner was sent, and they said, okay, we've got a six-month delay. You're going to take your medication. He says, I don't want to take my medication. It makes me feel weird. Then they had a special hearing to determine if he should take his medication, and the state then forced him to take the medication so he could become competent. That's a whole other strange issue, right? But typically within six months, and if not a six-month extension of the institutionalization may be ordered, right? And this is an interesting law that derived from the case of Jackson versus Indiana. A reasonable amount of time for commitment can be ordered, but it cannot be indefinite. That is, we can't be snapped up by the state, labeled as incompetent, and then shoved into a prison never to be, I mean, shoved into a mental institution never to be heard from again, right? Now, if these things don't pan out, then we look for civil commitment, and this is where we look to remand someone to an institution for a longer period of time with this specialized process. So what do you think? I think it's about time for us to return to the dilemmas. The first dilemma, when we're determining competency, when we're looking at insanity defenses, how might we apply the first dilemma? That is the right of the individual versus the common good. Because remember, being found to be incompetent is, in fact, probably offering due process. Trying someone who's not competent might then be more interpreted as an element of the common good, right? How are these applied, I guess, is the big question. The second dilemma, equality versus discretion. How do we know that this is happening equally, or is the law applied in a discretionary fashion on a case-by-case -case basis? The third dilemma. What are we about, ultimately, to discover the truth or to resolve conflict? Do we just need to try someone and have them either be let go or face the penalty that is resolve the conflict, or are we trying to figure out what's really going on here? And then law versus science is a source of decisions. So who's making the decisions? What are the criteria? And who should be making the decisions? So this leads us to homework seven, part three. Let us return to those dilemmas. For each of the four dilemmas, I would like you, please, to write a brief paragraph describing the dilemma as it relates to competency. For example, for the first dilemma, individual rights versus the common good. How does it apply to competency evaluation and its consequences? Again, just a brief paragraph for each, right, explaining one facet of the dilemma as applied to the issue of competency. So there you go. You got four dilemmas, A, B, C, and A, B, C, D. I don't know how you want to split your homework up. That's up to you guys. Uh, but part three. You ready for another Who Am I? Boom. Who am I? I think I asked you if you could imagine this one. Now, let's further the hint. If Imagine was a song title, who might we suppose wrote that song, Imagine? Which is like one of the ultimate peacenik songs. All right, this is Mark David Chapman, and he assassinated, he killed in cold blood, face to face, the Beatle, the former Beatle, John Lennon. Okay. And this happened outside the Dakota apartment building in New York City where John and Yoko were living. So let's look at Mark David Chapman's statement to the police. I went to the building. It's called the Dakota. I stayed there until he came out and asked him to sign my album. At that point, my big part won, and I wanted to go back to my hotel, but I couldn't. I waited until he came back. He came in a car. Yoko walked past first, and I said hello. I didn't want to hurt her. Then John came and looked at me and printed me. I took the gun from my coat pocket and fired at him. I just can't believe I could do that. I just stood there clutching the book. Five shots into John Lennon. Point blank range. Why? 
I mean, uh, this generally lists of people who, who could be killed, and how John Lennon ever emerged on that list is hard to understand, to put it mildly. I mean, John Lennon, give peace a chance. Well, okay. Now, w w oh, wait a second. Let's return to this notion. What book? What damn book is he clutching that supposedly has his motivational power to have Chapman kill in cold blood John Lennon? Well, you guessed it. Catch her in the rye. And what is it with this damn book, this freaky book that so many people say made them turn the corner to do something unimaginable, right? I don't know. How many of you have read The Catcher in the Rye? I had to read it, what, in 11th grade composition? Personally, I was not all that impressed. I mean, I went to school. I remember Bill, uh, one of my friends in school in 11th grade. Uh, he loved the book. He loved everything that J.D. Salinger wrote. But, I, man, I just like, man, Holden Caulfield just sounds like a whiny, self-centered little <laughs> turd to me. I mean, but a lot of people, you know, this book really speaks to them. I, I, I wasn't one of those, so maybe uh, I'm safe in that regard. I don't, I don't know. So there you go, J.D. Salinger. Mark David Chapman's statement to the police. Uh, and I'll not appeal any decision you have. If it's a decision to keep me here in the prison, I will not appeal it. And I never will. I'd like the opportunity to apologize to Mrs. Lennon. I've thought about what it's like in her mind to be there that night, to see the blood, to hear the screams, to be up all night with Beatle music playing through her apartment window. All right, uh, that doesn't sound necessarily grounded in reality. What do we know? Well, the assessment of Chapman. The psychiatrist concluded that while delusionally was competent to stand trial, <laughs> and, and that's walking a pretty fine line, huh, guys? Right? He's delusional, but he's competent. This is what's so tricky about the, the law, uh, the, the process here, and why it's so compellingly fascinating, right? Their diagnoses all differed, but six were prepared to testify for the defense that Trapman was psychotic. The prosecution had three psychiatrists that those delusions were short of the definition of psychosis. And now you know why psychologists look like and psychiatrists look like such imbeciles to the rest of the world. If psychology is a science, then how is it that we have six saying one thing and three saying a different? And notice that they're making these statements in front of the public. And the public is going, so you call psychology a science, but you can't agree on whether someone is psychotic or not. Can you imagine bringing a, a, a cup of water to nine chemists and having them disagree with six saying water is H2O and the other three saying something else. Let's face it, chemistry is a hard freaking science. People might listen. When you get to psychology, and especially its application of soft science, it's no wonder that there can be a public mistrust of psycho psychiatric evaluation and psychiatric processes, right? Because we look like fools when we disagree in public. Most people don't understand that there is room for disagreement in terms of diagnoses. Uh, most people want a black or white answer. Now, Chapman's decision, then, on June 8, two weeks before he was due to go to trial, he called Jonathan Marks, his new lawyer, his new lawyer, and he said suddenly he realized that God wanted him to plead guilty. Marks and the defense psychiatrist tried to talk him out of it, but, but Chapman was at a adamant. Marks asked Judge Dennis Edwards to have a panel re-examine him to determine if he was competent to make this decision to cop a plea. And at this point, the judge refused. Now, this makes for an interesting application of the dilemma, right? Due process versus the common good. Find the truth or resolve conflict. We can see that a couple applications of the dilemma just to the statement are possible, right? And, and this issue that, that suddenly realized that God wanted him to plead guilty is a strange source of advice, at least to some people, right? So Chapman talks with the judge, and on June 22nd, the press and public excluded, uh, right? 
Edwards questioned Chapman about whether he understood the implications of his plea change. To each question he answered, yes, your honor. He told the judge, this is my decision and this is God's decision. As I understand, the judge told him, you say that you were there with the intent to cause the death of John Winston Ono Lennon and that you fired five shots from your pistol with the intent to cause the death of John Winston Ono Lennon. And Chapman's reply was, yes, your honor. Okay. The judge's decision at this point then, impressed by Chapman's cool, collected manner, Edwards accepted the plea of guilty to second degree murder. Cops a reduced plea, right? For and I mean, cops a reduced sentence uh, in exchange for his plea. On August 24th, in a packed cart room, Edwards overruled Mark's last attempt to change the plea, and then he sentenced Chapman to a term of 20 years to life. He would be not eligible for uh, parole until the millennium year 2000, right? So, Chapman's denial. He's received little psychiatric treatment except after two violent incidents early in the imprisonment. This, that's the result of his own decision over strenuous objections of his lawyer to plead guilty to murder. His lawyers were confident he would have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, in which case he would have been committed to a state mental hospital rather than having to go to prison. And that's how that shakes out. Right? Chapman is still in prison. Lower profile criminals have been released by now. Chapman's had little chance of ever winning parole. He was turned down for the third time on October 5th, 2004, despite what the parole board called his exemplary discipline record. The decision was partly because of multiple threats to kill him if he were released. At Attica, he's in solitary confinement for his own protection. Lennon may have been a hero to some of his fellow inmates. Okay. So Ch Chapman's uh, 2004 parole hearing, the board ruled unanimously that Chapman's release would seriously, significantly under, uh, uh, undermine respect for the law. According to Governor, New York Governor George Pataki released a statement saying, it's just that he remain in prison for his violent crime. Okay. Chapman can try for parole again in 2006, that is every two, <laughs> every two years. So now he sits in his tiny cell trying to comprehend the act that his mind and body committed on December 8th, 1980. Wow. And, and it just kind of struck me, kind of reflect on this. I first taught this course in 2004. So I've been with Chapman in this lecture uh, for a long time now. Chapman's 2006 parole hearing, it was 16 minutes long. Institutional adjustment was rated as satisfactory, but because of the extremely violent nature of your crime, it would not serve the community's interest to release you. And I say, well, there's always 2008. Let's jump ahead a little bit. Let's go to 2012. Chapman said he was living in Hawaii when he decided to target Lennon because he was very famous. Now we're getting a different story. He also said he considered targeting television host Johnny Carson or actor George C. Scott. But Lennon was more famous, Chapman said. He insisted no anger towards Lennon. If he was less famous than the three other people on the list, he would not have been shot. Whoa. That's just scary from about six different angles, right? Let's fast forward to 2018. Okay. In 2018, he spoke of an internal tug-of-war over whether carrying out the killing, which he did hours after he met Lennon and got a record autographed. I was too far in, he said. I do remember having the thought of, hey, you've got the album now. Look at this. He signed it. Just go home. But there's no way that I was just going to go home. And we're left kind of wondering what exactly was he trying to accomplish in this murder, this assassination. So you guys, any guesses for his 2020 parole hearing, which just concluded not too long ago? In their final decision, the board states that Chapman carried out the assassination in the presence of Lennon's wife, who will be forever impacted by his heinous actions. Lennon's children lost an opportunity to experience life with their loving father. They add that his release would deprecate the seriousness of crime as to undermine respect for the law. And if you'd like, I've got a link in there so you can go ahead and click the link to look at the, the entire parole transcript if you wish. Okay. What do we know? Well, part of the parole board 
uh, and, and their decision to not release Chapman is the ongoing efforts of Yoko Ono to lobby the parole board to repeatedly submit letters, etc., to say, don't let this guy out. Uh, I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid he's going to come after me. I'm afraid for my family that he's going to come after them. And there's really no way that you can say, oh, no, he won't do that. <laughs> Uh, and, and you can imagine being on a parole board. It's like, do I want to be on the parole board that releases Mark David Chapman? No. I mean, there's no gain in that whatsoever, right? So, Lennon fans organized an online petition, and they still circulate this petition on occasion, right, to uh, make sure that Chapman rela remains in prison for the rest of his life. This wall, th this portion, this is a wall in Prague, the Czech Republic, right, that was dedicated to John Lennon. Uh, and it, it's the wall has now since been removed, but they maintained this. In fact, one of the students, one of our fellow Buckeyes, had traveled to Prague and uh, had informed me of the new status uh, of that uh, art on the wall. So, and of course, this is going way back. So, and Parole uh, Court of New York, right? This is the, the petition contents in, in one form of the petition. We, the undersigned, believe that Mark David Chapman should not be granted parole for the murder of John Lennon. Chapman committed a heinous crime, unprovoked and without remorse. He shot to death John Lennon, a man who signed an autograph for him only six hours earlier. He deserves to pay for this with his life in prison. It's a matter of public safety not be released. He would not be uh, free to harm anyone else right? if we keep him in. Please remember John Lennon, right, who believed in peace, and he was... Uh, vocal advocate for peace. Uh, Mark David Chapman, 49 year old, John Lennon never got to see his 40th birthday. And, and so it goes. This is a, a picture of crowds assembling outside the Depo Dakota apartment building when they heard of uh, John Lennon's murder. So, high impact crime for an awful lot of people. Uh, it's at the time John Lennon was arguably uh, you know, one of the most famous per people on the planet, actually, when you get to it. So, the insanity defense, what's our deal? Well, it's hard to make a judgment, right? It's, it's not whether they did it. That's not enough, because we know in this case, Mark David Chapman did it. But, why did he do it? And that becomes the critical aspect to the insanity defense because we have to take a look at why did they do this? And did, and we're going to look at some of the standards here. So, not just whether they were, they are insane, but whether they were insane. And isn't this a, a fascinating issue? Because if the trial, let's say, is two years, three years after the crime, which is not uncommon in high-profile trials, what we're doing then is convincing a jury that two years ago this person was insane when they committed this act. Insane to the extent that they shouldn't help be held responsible and thus found not guilty of the crime. Uh, that's, you know, an interesting hurdle, a uh, bar to, to jump, right? And there aren't many assessments available. The Rogers Criminal Responsibility Scale maybe gets us there, but it's really not enough. In our court system, in the United States, it's ultimately up for the jurors to make this determination on sanity or insanity, right? And, and further complicates matters. Insane is not a psychological term, it's a legal term. So, legal definitions then? Let us go back to 1843. And this is the case of Daniel McNaughton, a deranged woodcutter, and that just sounds scary as all get out, doesn't it? A deranged woodcutter, because woodcutters have sharp instruments. And if they're deranged, that seems especially intimidating, right? He attempted to assassinate the prime minister who he thought was plotting against him. So McNaughton was probably a paranoid schizophrenic. I mean, we can't, we can't know that for sure. And, and what happened is he tried to kill the prime minister, but he killed the prime minister's assistant instead right and then he goes to court and they say you can't you can't convict him because he's out of his mind he's 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 insane and queen victoria is like oh my god you killed a minister of my government <laughs> and, and and then the court let him go she was pissed off so out of this grew the mcnaughton rule and that is this is the criteria then for be considered 
insane in the legal system. And notice the McNaughton Rule is something that carried over from Great Britain to the United States. Right? Defendant must prove that a disease of the mind excuses their conduct, right? Because the defendant didn't know what they were doing, and the defendant didn't know what they were doing was wrong. Now, this is a tough hurdle. Because look at the profound nature of the psychological disability we're discussing here. Hey, I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know that what I was doing was wrong. So maybe, you know, I, I, I've killed my neighbor, but I, I mounted an insanity defense. And what I have to prove then is I didn't realize I was killing my neighbor. So right off the bat, often these are religiously toned defenses. That God spoke to me and told me that my neighbor was the Antichrist. That that's not actually my neighbor, but it's the Antichrist posing as my neighbor. My neighbor is actually somewhere else. And God directed me to kill the Antichrist to save the world from Satan. So what I was doing in committing this murder wasn't wrong. It was actually right and directed by God. Notice that I have to weave quite a narrative, right, to achieve the level of the insanity defense or what this implies. Now, that's extreme, but you kind of get the idea. This is not an easy bar to reach in the minds of the jurors. Okay. More on that. We'll get statistical evidence, if you will. Now, it remains a standard in 26 states in the United States, and it's also the standard used by the federal courts, the federal government in the United States. So, it is widely used as a standard, as the bar for determining insanity and thus the release from responsibility. Now, mental health professionals argue it's too restrictive, that we should back off and maybe uh, kind of loosen the criteria to a certain extent because there's very few people who qualify as insane under this idea. So what happened? Well, in, in, in 43, McNaughton, Scottish woodcutter, shot and killed Edward Drummond, secretary uh, to England's prime minister, Sir Robert Peel. He acted under the belief he was actually shooting the prime minister because he believed there was a plot against him. So you can see that's a pretty cut and dried uh, evidence of paranoid schizophrenia if you want to go there. So, Next up. Who am I? Number 12. And remember I said you got to go in the Wayback Machine for this one. Who are we talking here? Well, you guys still don't have it? Well, let me give you a hint. Screaming, you must die! You must die! He shot Philip Barton Key several times in the street in 1859. Anyone? Philip Barton Key. 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 Historic United States name. Key. Philip Barton Key. Who's Philip Barton Key? He's the son of Francis Scott Key, the man who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, there you go. Just a little bit of trivia. Uh, and what do we know? Well, we know <laughs> that he's a former Union general, okay, and named Congressman Daniel Sickles. So not only does this guy kill Philip Barton Key, he wanted on to become a general in the Union Army and from there uh, elevated to the status of congressman. Huh. Murder someone and become congressman. Uh, it doesn't sound that much different than our day and age right now. Right? Ursula, what are you doing, Ursula? She's not up here that often, so I'm interested to see what she wants from us. Okay. There you go. Now, why did all this occur? Well, here's the deal. Philip Barton Key was having an affair with Sickles' wife. And upon finding this out, Sickles... Uh, goes off his nut, right? He he goes crazy. I mean, and out in the street, right? He's, you must die, you must die. And he shoots this d guy down in the middle of the street in front of everybody, right? Well, let's face it. The shame and the embarrassment of being cheated upon sent him into such a rage that we're going to call this temporary insanity. This is not someone who's mentally ill, but because of the situation, the force of the situation, becomes mentally ill for that moment in time. 
Wow. Now we've got a whole other issue. Temporary insanity as opposed to, <laughs> what, long-term insanity? So, an early insanity criterion, if we go back to 86 and Parsons versus Alabama, uh, decision established additional criteria for the insanity defense. The court decided that a person could utilize insanity defense if he could prove by reason of duress of mental disease he had so far lost the power to choose between right and wrong and thus not able to avoid doing the act in question. That is, their free agency, free will if you will, right, was undermined to the point that they had no control over themselves. So this is temporary insanity. Notice, back in the day, the embarrassment of being cheated on brought him such shame that he reacted in a manner that was out of control, that he was not constrained or able to constrain himself in any kind of rational manner. So, we have a fancier term for this, and we're going to call this the irresistible impulse. And this is the birth of the irresistible impulse. So now, we're not saying, hey, you didn't know what you were doing, you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. That's off the table. What we're saying is, hey, we have a new insanity criteria. Who wants to use it? Which states, etc. But we have a new insanity criteria that says you couldn't help yourself. So now you could know what you were doing. You could know what you were doing was wrong, but you didn't have the capacity to control yourself. This really, really then allows a much broader application of the insanity defense. And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing, right? And you can imagine there's differing opinions on that. So the irresistible impulse is born, it became known as the irresistible impulse test, or as an earlier court in England called it, the policeman at the elbow test. What a wonderful descriptor. In other words, if the person would have committed the crime, even if a policeman was standing next to him, then the act could be characterized as an irresistible impulse because no sane person would commit a criminal act in the presence of a law enforcement agent. Well, that's an interesting descriptor. It provides interesting imagery, but what exactly then is an irresistible impulse?